José and found, uh, I uh, found it very interesting. Uh, it's called, uh, maybe you can, uh, you can open it. It's called uh, the Asia SAF ET product, an operation service of sub daily estimation of ev evapotranspiration in near real time across Europe, Africa, and Eastern South America. So, for those who are familiar with uh, this satellite, so the land surface analysis, LSA, and the uh, SAF satellite application facility. So for those who are uh, well familiar with this satellite product. So let's have a talk to Jose Barrios. So you have 15 minutes. And, uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am yeah, Miguel, of Jose Miguel. Uh, I come from the Royal Meteorological Institute of Belgium. Yes, I, I was the, the, the title was already introduced. It's about the LSA SAF ET product, which is a, an operational service that delivers estimates of evapotranspiration across Europe, Africa, and Eastern South America. This is three main points in my presentation. First, what is the LSA SAF program? Then I will go into the evapotranspiration product itself, and I will wrap up with what I think are the main messages to remember after the, the session. The LSA SAF program. Uh, first of all, it is an UMETSAT program. UMETSAT is the you know is the agency for the European Agency for Meteorological Satellites. LSA SAF, and we call it LANSAF, is well. It has already been said: satellite application facility, satellite application facility on light surface analysis. The big objective of the LANSAF is to take full advantage of the meteorological satellites in order to derive. Uh, variables, uh, quantities related to land, land atmosphere interactions, uh, etc. And well, the Landsaf is a there is a consortium of, of institutions uh, com composing the Landsaf. So far, this is this what you see here is the portfolio of products that have been developed within the the, the Landsaf program. We can group them in sort of families, the solar radiation related ones. There we can have albedo. Downwelling, short and long wave radiation, land surface temperature. We have the vegetation family with uh, several products there, you know, NDVI, LAI, etc. Some of these products, together with other that I will tell about later, are used to, cal to calculate energy balance on the Earth's surface. And on the basis of this energy balance, we can derive evapotranspiration, the surface heat fluxes, uh, which is what I will focus on today. Uh, the platforms used in the Landsat are basically two, two satellite platforms, the Meteosat second generation satellite and METOP. Uh, MNC or the Meteosat second generation is, as you may know, a geostationary satellite. That means it delivers different observations per day, uh, 96. So there, are, there is a data set produced every 15 minutes. The spatial resolution is three, kilo, three kilometer at nadir point. And right, it has been said already, it covers Europe, Africa, Eastern, South America. You see it in this panel to the left. Uh, METOP is a, is a polar orbits uh, satellite. There is a, another group of, of products derived from, from, from these observations. This satellite is carrying the ABHRR sensor on it. And the products delivered from METOP, or derived from METOP, are one kilometer resolution with a global coverage. Okay, this is short, in short what Landsat is. Now we can go to the evapotranspiration itself. This evapotranspiration is basically the flux of water going from the Earth's surface into the, the, the atmosphere. It is composed by various components, basically transpiration uh, from plants, the evaporation from water stored in the upper layers of the soil, evaporation uh, from water in the, in the water bodies. Uh, yes. And perhaps it's needless to say, this is a very important element of the water balance, together with precipitation, runoff, uh, uh, yeah, storage in the soil, and the flow that you get in the outlet of, of a watershed. 
fortunately, with the, the, in this this parameter, this this quantity of evapotranspiration has its parallel, so to speak, in the surface energy balance. That you see the equation over there, and I am referring to the latent heat flux, which is the the energy required for for water to become uh, vapor. So these are like two uh, parallel quantities or, or two parallel ways of, of approaching this quantity, and this is actually this is by by solving the energy balance the that we say all the, the algorithms relying on remote sensing uh, are based on. So this is in a, a scheme showing the, the algorithm we, we, that is driving the, the, our products. Uh, we see here in the second panel again the, the, the energy of the, the sort, sorry the equation of the energy balance. Uh, but first, I have told you the we are based on the metastat second generation, so. We have the grid of the metastat second generation, and for every cell, for every pixel in this in this grid, we can recognize up to four different land cover types. This is what we call tiles. This is what is happening in the first step, and then we go to the second, which is the actual calculation of the energy balance. This is done for every tile, and in the third step, this is aggregated to get to a pixel value. So all the contribution of the different tiles are put together and this is where we can have a pixel value and this is happening every 30 minutes so we can have a half hourly estimation of the energy balance across the whole field of view at the end of the day the what this has been computed in the day is aggregated to get a daily estimate of evapotranspiration this is in a nutshell how it works just go back for a, for a second uh, I have told you we, we rely on other Landsat products, like the vegetation ones, the solar radiation ones, but we have we, we need also other forcing. This we get from the ECMWF, I'm talking about the meteorological forcing, and we rely also on a land cover map. This is always behind our product, and many parameters are connected to, to the different land cover classes. Yes, we can go on. And this is an example of what the product in the end looks like. This, what you see there, is the what has been produced in the course of one day. This is the this this visualization. This is a visualization of the 48 uh, estimates in the course of one day. I repeat here the, the main characteristics of this product. They are produced every 30 minutes. Three three kilometer spatial resolution at nail point. We can move to the next slide. And this is the daily. Uh, the daily product. This is what it looks like here. I am showing only a sample of the 15th day of every month in a particular year, just as example. This is what uh, most users use to to derive the annual patterns and to make comparison to detect anomalies. This is the kind of applications you can you can get here. here I am showing here three particular points uh, as an example of what the daily product looks like. Can, how do we do the quality control? We rely on different sources, but basically, perhaps this is the most important one: uh, measurements at field, field measurements uh, performed on, in eddy covariance stations. There are networks we usually use, the, like the Fluxnet, the EFDC datasets, uh, and there are others. I'm just showing here an example, and perhaps uh, the most important ones. You see the, the difference in density in the different parts of the world. There is a, a, a lack of density in, in big areas of the world, for instance, South America. Africa is also uh, lacking sampling in some parts of Asia. What we do with this data is actually basic statistics, comparing our results with what these uh, field measurements are, 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 are telling us. For example, uh, plots like this. This is a, a, a site in, in Germany. We also look at what other products are giving. There are other well-established products that is always interesting to look at. This is a list of some of them. We can go to the next uh, slide. Here we, we have a comparison of what the annual uh, pattern looks like according to the different products. And here we see a great agreement uh, among the different products. It's an interesting plot to look at to, to see how different the the pattern can be depending on the climate, depending on the geographical location, and yes, I think we, we, it is it is good to see that we can have this kind of agreements with the different products that are available. Yes, another sources is 
to, of, to, to check the quality is to, to look to, to what other studies are doing, using or not our product. For instance, this study is a quite interesting study uh, on estimates of evapotranspiration from different remote sensing products, but also from hydrological modeling across the, the Congo Basin. And the authors of this paper were so nice that they shared also their data. So then it was possible for us to do the exercise to see what our product looks like. And it was nice to see that it was corresponding very much. It, it's falling within the variability of the different uh, products that were analyzed in this study. Uh, and uh, well, this is just an example of a very simple exercise of things we can do with actual evapotranspiration together with other Landsat products or, or with other products coming from, from other sources. This is a, a, a very simple visualization of, of droughts. This is a, these are very recent data of August and July of this year. Uh, by simple calculate, simply calculating the ratio of real and potential, and, and sorry, and, and reference about transpiration, which is also another product of Landsat. And this can give already a visualization. But of course, there are many more uh, drought indicators that can be perhaps more elaborated and, and better sound, but this was just to give an example of the kind of, of things we can do. Uh, yes, we can move. And perhaps an important point is the data access. There is only one address to, to get to, to this data. They are freely available and the, the, you can write down this, this address. This is the, the platform of, for data access from Landsat. There you can find also all the documentation. And, and, the, and all the data, and all the, the portfolio of the Landsat is available there. Concerning evapotranspiration, I can repeat here, we have daily evapotranspiration, but we, can, we have also the half hourly estimates. And very soon, it is not yet available if you go now, but I know the data is ready, it will be released soon, uh, climate data record. And that is actually a run, uh, a, a, a reprocessing that was done from the the, the start of the operational life of Meteosat till now, and that gives 17 years of, uh, of, of, of evapotranspiration estimate. This will be soon available. Okay, I will, I arrive now to the end of my presentation, and I think four big messages to, to remember. First of all, what is the Landsat? This is a, a UMEDSAT program, and the, the objective of the Landsat is to exploit at its maximum, the, the, all the information containing the satellite observations. So, just to, to remember, for those who were not familiar with the Landsat, the Landsat includes also the, the evapotranspiration product, which was the main focus of this presentation. It's generating data on near real time, and this is perhaps the, the, an important point to emphasize, as this session is about monitoring. <coughs> Uh, these, these data are being delivered and are made accessible in near real time. That means if you go now, it's possible that you can already find the data of three or four hours ago. So it's, you don't have to wait too long. That is, that is important for, for monitoring, I think. The validation exercises have shown uh, that it's, a good, it's, a, it's an acceptable quality product. It's not perfect. We are aware of some points that have to be improved, but I think it is mature enough is reliable enough to be used. And well, again, the address that you can go to if you want to explore the data yourself to access it. And this is how I conclude. And finally, uh, let's get in touch. If you need more information, this is my email address. Uh, and there is also a website there where you know, what our research group does uh, in addition to, to working in the lands of products. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. It's a very interesting presentation, and uh, especially like in Africa, where we need this kind of metrosat uh, second generation. Uh, I wish also I could hear from you the metrosat third generation. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, I removed the slide just for the sake of time, but it, yeah, it's a, it's a good point to announce that the, third, the metrosat third generation is coming. And with, with, with the upcoming of Metrosat third generation, all these lands of products will follow. That means the spatial resolution will increase, the temporal resolution will increase. Now we have half hourly data, it will become every 20 minutes instead of every 30 minutes. 
so yes, this is something to That's we great. are already working on that. Yes. That's great. Uh, maybe before others maybe contribute or comment, I have a, a small uh, question on uh, resolution. You see, if uh, we talked about evapotranspiration, it is behind on uh, some linkage on weather dynamics. And uh, I was wondering, what do you think uh, the accuracy in a region with higher mountain and lower mountain? So I mean the valleys, because the, the, those process may be different. So what do you have you, have you checked the agreement with other data set so that you can say that uh, our product are very accurate in high mountain or just uh, in valleys? Yes, well, two, two things. First, uh, we rely very much on how the ECMD, the European Center for Weather and Forecasting, takes into account this, this altitude difference, this topographical difference. They take that into account in their forecasts. And since this forecast is a very important uh, input for us, we are automatically also benefiting from these improvements. One, of, one concrete improvement was in the beginning of this let's say the early, the, the, the very first version of this algorithm was having the, the surface pressure at sea level as input. Now it is accounting for this, this difference. And with this, we, we saw a difference, we saw an improvement. So it is, yes, the, it is being taken into account. Uh, and also that you, you, you take also some input for reanalysis data like ERA5, like also MODIS. So how you can uh, compare make a comparison when the data set, are do they don't have the same spatial resolution or temporal resolution. How we make that, that kind of comparison? Well, the, the ERA-5 is not, is not part of the, of the input of this operational product. Here I can distinguish between the operational product and the one I said that is going to be released soon. The operational product cannot rely on, on reanalysis data because otherwise it cannot be near real time. Uh, it relies on, on forecast. Uh, the climate data record, on the other hand, it, it relies on, on ERA-5 because it's already a, a fixed data set. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be in, in, in near real time. And the mod is, it is not really a, an input. It's, it's, a, it's another product. There is a mod is about transpiration product. And we just make comparisons just to see, okay, in this region, what is the what the models looks like, and the same we do with Gleam, with GLDAS, yeah. with others, and just to make comparisons, uh, we the, the patterns we derive from are, is it different than the others? In case it is different, but then we can have a closer look to a particular region to see it, what can be the, the explanation. Can it be that there is a problem in our data or in our simulation, or perhaps the aspect you said is more a resolution problem? that the MODIS has, of course, a, a higher resolution, and perhaps they are uh, highlighting features that our product is not able to... Yes, but yes, this is... Uh, it's only for comparison. Thank you so much. So, if someone has a, a comment or a question, so that we can move to the next presentation, is there someone who have a, a comment, suggestion? <laughs> okay, if there is no, if you have uh, uh, appreciated, so we can move to the second, second presentation by... Also, this kind of uh, because in Rwanda Space Agency, I forgot that to present myself. Uh, we work in the Rwanda Space Agency, so we have a, a climate observatory. So where we measure greenhouse gases, we measure uh, pollutant, but also the weather uh, parameters because the wind contributes a lot in distribution of those uh, emissions. So that's why I'm interested also to hear from you. Uh, this kind of topic, land pollution, lockout, engaging citizen scientists in analyzing Niger Delta, oil spills, so or using satellite image. So you can... Uh, 
Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Victor Sundi, uh, the National Coordinator of uh, Unique Mapas Network and uh, lecturer at the University of Botaco Geography and Environmental Management, uh, uh, presenting this work uh, on behalf of uh, our co-authors, uh, Professor uh, as well, Professor Sarah Willey, uh, who is uh, uh, the, one of the co-principal investigators at Northeastern University, and uh, Dr. Seth Copper, who works with uh, uh, the of uh, US. And then uh, we also have Caroline Nickerson, who works with Science Data. So uh, this uh, collaborative work uh, between about, I think about four organizations, uh, Unique Purpose Network, Science Data, uh, Healthy Gulf, and uh, Northeastern University. And uh, our passion about this work is to drive uh, citizen uh, science engagement, uh, to drive uh, uh, non pollution lookout, uh, specifically in Niger Delta, uh, using uh, satellite images. And uh, these are the outline we have. Yeah, so uh, when we talk about uh, engaging volunteer, uh, engaging volunteers in participatory citizen science, we see that citizen science is becoming a, a globally uh, trending uh, uh, technique for crowdsource uh, data collection, uh, data analysis, and so on. And so uh, it gives opportunity for everyone to have a stake in the process of uh, scientific research. And so uh, when we talk about uh, uh, citizen science, we see it as a, a nexus of multidisciplinary uh, scientific experts and non-experts. So uh, both the, uh, uh, the, the experts and the non-experts were engaged in this particular uh, research. And so we focused on the Niger Delta region, which is the epicenter of uh, oil exploration in the Nigeria, uh, where communities and the ecology are highly vulnerable to oil spill and so on. So uh, right there in the Niger Delta, we have more than 900 oil spills that are rec reported within the last two years. And so the United Nations for Environment also has provided an assessment of the region, and especially the Ogoni land in particular, and uh, which uh, reveals that there is need for environmental restoration. And so we wanted to see how we can uh, use a satellite validation by citizens' engagement to identify the patterns of uh, pollution in the area. And so uh, the project uh, deals with identifying damages from oil spill in the area using satellite imagery. And uh, just like I mentioned before, it's organized by the Nigerian and the uh, US nonprofits. And so we examined about 368 uh, OSP locations that are reported in two protected uh, Ramsar wetlands uh, between 2020 and 2022. And so the participants we engaged were trained to identify. Uh, pipelines, oil spills, uh, damage to vegetation and uh, rivers, creeks, and, and so on, using uh, the satellite imagery we extracted. And uh, we actually engaged uh, these participants, uh, about 250 of them that contributed during the Citizen Science Global Month uh, that was facilitated by the Science Data, that was in April 2022. And so uh, we engage them in contributing over 834 levels, providing an average of about 96 assessment of 368 images for four different patterns. You can see the patterns there. One is the pipeline, the oil spill, the damage to vegetation and uh, rivers and so on. So the study focused actually on the three oil spill hotspots in the Niger Delta which is mainly the Ogoni land, uh, the Apoi Creek Ramsar site, the Orashio Guta Lake Ramsar site, uh, in River State and Bayesa, as well as Imo State. 
respectively. And so uh, in our methodology, what we did was to invite uh, these participants, volunteers, uh, specifically from Nigeria and other parts of the world, uh, to engage them in uh, examining a, a series of uh, satellite imageries so that they can determine the four specific characteristics related to oil spills that are present in the, in the, in the image, whether those characteristics are found there or not. And so, in a, and then in addition, we also try to ask them to find out uh, uh, oil spill images and then to help them also to, uh, to see how the, 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 the proximity between the pipeline and the oil spill, uh, oil hotspot, oil spill hotspots, the proximity to waterways, and then the damage to vegetation. In our site selection, we focused, like I mentioned earlier, on, on these uh, particular three areas. The Apoi Creek is a major Ramsar site, and then uh, Okutan Lake and the Orashi site, uh, Orashi Ramsar, Ramsar sites, they are also uh, part of the Ramsar sites that are globally organize, uh, recognized. And then the Ogoni land, which is the major area that uh, the UNED uh, has actually provided uh, an assessment. And so we, we focused on these uh, three sites to, uh, to investigate on this uh, uh, pollution uh, lookout in Niger Delta. Next slide. Yeah, that's a map of the area. You can see the state, uh, Bayesa, River State, and Imo State. And then the one in the purple uh, covers the area of focus, the Niger Delta region in Nigeria. Yeah, the next slide. And uh, here you have the, 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 the bounding boxes we're able to create uh, to help us extract the satellite imageries we, to, uh, we gave to the, or we assigned to the participants to identify uh, the four patterns. You can see the one covering uh, the Oguta area, the Orashi area, and then the down this way is the area covering the Apoi Creek. And then this one uh, to the left here is uh, covering the Ogoni. Uh, uh, Ogoni land uh, oil spill uh, hotspots. And so uh, for them to actually participate in this uh, science uh, engagement to identify uh, uh, to, to validate the satellite imageries with respect to the patterns, we, we were able to design uh, tutorials that help to teach them how to identify where there's oil spill, where there is pipeline, where there is vegetation, where there is uh, uh, waterways, and so on, in those sampled images. And so, uh, running through the online platform, you could, we, we gave them uh, uh, a tutorial so that once they run through it, they are able to see yes or no, yes or no, and then the tutorial will be able to let them know whether they got it right or not. So, we annotated the uh, uh, example images in the data set. And so uh, we were able to coordinate that with science data in the month uh, between just within 10 days uh, during which uh, a 10 day sprint uh, between, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, in April, during which uh, we were able to engage them and then uh, be able to get their results. Yeah, the next. So these are the uh, satellite imageries and uh, the tutorials. Uh, you can see the tutorial for land uh, pollution. Look at the uh, Niger damaged vegetation. Then this one is for uh, oil spill. Then the down one is for pipeline. And then this one is for uh, waterways. And so. Then you can also see uh, the, 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 the other one, uh, the one for uh, rivers and creek. And then, so we, we provided these uh, tutorials so that uh, once they click, uh, it will give
give them yes or no. Do you see a pipeline pattern in this photo? Yes or no? Uh, do you see this? And then that helps us to actually engage a lot of them. And uh, by doing so, they are validating the satellite imageries to enhance accuracy of uh, what is being observed uh, through the uh, satellite uh, imagery. Yeah, next slide. So these are all the tutorials for the uh, uh, for the patterns for each of the pattern, and then on the result, you can see the results we were able to uh, get the sections that uh, uh, were carried out by the total number of people, the patterns uh, for oil spill, uh, for pipeline, for waterways, for damage, uh, vegetation. And so on, and then even the minutes uh, that it took them, the total, uh, uh, the duration, the total duration it took them to really run through each of those uh, uh, pattern. Uh, so, and then here you have the results also uh, of the contributions uh, being shown for each of uh, the pattern, uh, uh, showing where they are able to identify accurately. Uh, for each of the pattern, the oil spill, the uh, pipeline, the uh, river, creek, and then the damaged vegetation. So on this, you, you are able to see uh, that where uh, the, the number of times they participated and then where they actually got those uh, uh, images, uh, patterns accurately uh, validated. Uh, one thing about this work is that uh, it helped us to, you know, uh, engage a lot of people, a lot of volunteers uh, uh, in a citizen science engagement to validate repeatedly uh, uh, what they see, what they can identify, and then we doing that. We, we, with that, we can actually say yes that uh, this can actually help us in environmental monitoring uh, of the pollution in the in the area. Yeah, so citizen science engagement requires effective participation of the professional and non-professional in driving scientific course. And so this project achieved the main aim, the main objective of driving citizen engagement in identifying and labeling potential damage using satellite imagery. So the project uh, shows potential, uh, uh, great potential for informal science learning as nearly all participants reported increased knowledge of oil spill in the Niger Delta region following participation in the project. Those reporting knowing very little or nothing about uh, the issue decreased by over 50%. Additionally also, uh, there is that strong inter-participant uh, participant agreement and comparison with available ground truth data which suggests that participants are currently able to assess images for ecological futures associated with oil spill. Although the project within the time constraint was limited by fewer expert reviewers, and then satellite imagery also was limited to uh, extracted images with dates from map box. So uh, the project actually unveiled the capability of student science in validation of eight observation satellite imagery for environmental monitoring and disaster res response. The project also has identified numerous topics for future citizen science research in this area, and based on participant feedback, there is a strong interest in citizen science engagement for pollution monitoring in the Niger Delta uh, and beyond. And so uh, uh, we have the website there, we have the YouTube there for land pollution lookout in Niger Delta. And uh, the project is right there for any one of us to you know, go ahead and uh, participate as well uh, in the Kato School. So you can run through the uh, satellite imagery and then be able to let us know what you see. Do you see always spill? Do you see potential uh, oil spill damage? Do you see potential vegetation? And so on. Depend, uh, based on those five, uh, five patterns, we've been able to you know, upload on the platform. Thank you for listening.
Thank you so much. And I really like that you have also engaged the non-professional <laughs> so that also they can uh, have this knowledge uh, uh, from satellite. But uh, just a quick question. I didn't hear about uh, the satellite, satellite you have used. Yeah, thank you. I know this question. We need, we need to... I know this question will come. <laughs> yes, if you look through, we mentioned that one of our constraints to the project was uh, the issue of satellite uh, imagery with respect to the spatial resolution, the type, and so on. And as at the time of uh, carrying out this particular project, we actually wanted to uh, get high resolution satellite imagery from the, 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 the custodians of these satellite imagery, but it was not really easy for us to assess. And so the only way we could really push ahead with the project was to go to Mapbox and extract satellite imagery covering those bounding boxes. You can get back to the other map. Yeah, covering. So we extracted, then we used these bounding boxes to extract satellite imagery from Mapbox. And uh, we all know that Mapbox has high resolution satellite imagery. <laughs> and so uh, that helps us to, you know, uh, engage the volunteers in seeing what is, uh, uh, what could be visible on the ground and then helping them to really, yes, ascertain whether it's a pipeline, whether it's, there's a potential oil spill damage, whether there's a vegetation damage. So we actually made use of uh, high resolution satellite That's imagery. Great. Thank That's you. Great. Uh, there is a place called uh, Ayori. There's a place called Ayori. Is it Ayori? Nigeria. Ayori? Uh, yeah. So there is, a, there is a network called uh, Ironet. Ironet from NASA. So they have a, a, a station station that on ground okay. for IOSO. Okay. So it is located in the IORI. Okay. So when I was doing my PhD, uh, I, I know that I used those data. That's why, so I was wondering if you knew that it is, it is a city, it is a province, I don't know. Yeah. So I was uh, waiting to hear from from Marshall about IORI. Uh, is that a lorry? Or yes. Okay, a lorry or so. I think it is a coastal area. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I can, I can really get that. Okay, so yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Maybe Joseph, can you advise yeah. uh, what kind of satellite you can? Yeah, we, we, we actually need to assess high resolution satellite because this project is still ongoing. We're going to continue in that. But we want one of the reasons why we wanted to present this at this forum is to have access to those who can give us satellite imagery. Uh, that will help us yeah, subsequently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, so that uh, we don't just go to Mapbox and extract a heart. So, uh, if we have satellite imagery that could help us, and then with specific dates covering specific uh, oil spills, a uh -huh. So, like we mentioned, we have more than 900 oil spills in the last two years. So, we want to have high resolution satellite images with specific dates uh, for a period of time so that we can actually engage larger uh, citizens in, uh, in validating those images. Thank, Thank you so much. So, well, I, I don't know if I'm the right person, but uh, <laughs> yes. Even our what I can think of yes, immediately is Sentinel-2. Yes, yes, maybe also you can help us. <laughs> I think so Sentinel-2, Sentinel I think. Uh, we have seen in, in the, this morning also some uh, some images, very nice images from the Airbus. But I assume this is too costly, perhaps. But if but to take a, a, this aspect into account, I would say Sentinel two. Yes. Thank you so much. Maybe we can continue because of the time is running fast. So the third presentation is uh, um, Crystal, yes. yes. <laughs> so maybe 
Yes, yes, please, thank you. So, Christo is going to talk about uh, real time and ecosystem assessment. Uh, very interesting uh, topic, also. Um, so, he start by presenting himself. So, we have 15 minutes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, fellow delegates. My name is Christo Wittel. I'm from the CSR in Cape Town, South Africa, and I'm representing Marcosio. I'll tell you a bit about Marcosio as we go along. And I'm talking about bridging the gap between their real time and ecosystem assessment needs, going beyond just providing their real time data, but considering data in context of what's happened before and how to arrive at that data. Next slide, please. So Marcosia has 12 partners. We wanted the consortium within GMS with the Southern Consortium. Uh, it represents eight countries. Uh, it was formerly known as Marine Coastal Operations in Southern Africa, but it's now a Marine Coastal Operations in Southern Africa and the Indian Ocean. The objective is to make the services available to all the stakeholders within our region and to foster intergovernmental cooperation. And this is achieved through using Earth observation data, geo geophysical model data, and technologies towards uh, marine cost protection, development and growth, but to be able to disseminate this information in a meaningful way to the stakeholders within the region. Next slide, please. So uh, we want to be able to influence or at least contribute towards uh, policy development and uh, institutional framework development to providing access to data from uh, uh, Copernicus and other sources to develop services which they can present to the community, our stakeholders at large, and uh, develop uh, to do knowledge management, cross fertilization between the different uh, partners within our group, and then also build capacity, not just with amongst human capacity, but also institutional capacity and infrastructure, and then reach a wider audience from subsistence to managers through outreach, uptake, and dissemination. For the moment, I'm just going to be talking about one of the services, aquaculture. I'm going to be focusing on South Africa, and looking at the Southern Benguela, looking at this area in white, which is the shelf of the Southern Benguela, looking at uh, um, everything between 500 meters to the shore. And uh, next slide, please. Well, no, 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 one back. Yeah. So uh, this is the season of temperature image, and as you can see, uh, at the bottom right, I've got a little diagram illustrating coastal upwelling. Now, the Southern Benguela, or the Benguela as a whole, is a very productive upwelling system, one of the most productive in the world. And the physical aspects of that production is well delineated by sea surface temperature images. So we're going to be talking about how to use and improve on the sea surface temperature products to develop a, a regional product for the Benguela. Next slide, please. Of course, then the product of that production, the actual uh, primary productivity, the chlorophyll concentration, is represented through images of uh, chlorophyll and concentration as a proxy for productivity. Next slide, please. And then what I want to focus on, particularly that has quite a big impact on the south coast and on the west coast of South Africa's harmful algal blooms. Next slide, please. So quickly, just how do these alpha algal blooms actually form? How do they proliferate? So the first uh, uh, image that's uh, got a red block around it, actually the diagram shows that during the setup phase, when you have active upwelling, the water is very turbulent, the wind is mixing it, and these conditions aren't conducive to the proliferation or sudden explosion of red tide organisms. But the red tide organisms aggregate in this line where you see the arrow and the dotted line along a frontal zone just offshore of the coast. Next slide, please. So, no, 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 one back. <laughs> so, um, during the, the next phase, during the wind relaxation phase, Right? The wind drops, the water column becomes more stable, and these conditions are then conducive to the proliferation of red tide organisms, specifically dinoflagellates. The water then recedes back to the coast, and often a countercurrent is formed, as that white arrow is showing with the water moving southward. Elands Bay is indicated in that uh, Sentinel 2 image, and then also Elands Bay is seen in the two diagrams. So then, the red tide is advected back towards the coast with the harmful effects associated with it. Next slide, please. So, how does it affect? What kind of fisheries are we expecting? So, the rock lobster is an important commodity on the west coast of South Africa. It's uh, um, uh, harvested commercially and also by subsistence farmers. And it's one of the pre pre premier products for subsistence farmers along the west coast. The problem with the presence of rare tides, 
are that often you will result in big losses, 415 tons of rock lobster stranded, 21 tons of mussels, and various fish species due to the presence of a rare tide in 2015. That was a big economic loss. Now, it doesn't just affect the subsistence farmers, but also farming in terms of aquaculture. So in South Africa, we've got various aquaculture farming activities from abalone, finfish, mussels, and oysters. Over, overall, mussels is the largest sector, and the toxins produced by these red tide organisms accumulate in the tissues of the mussels and then become toxic for consumption to, to humans. So this affects the, pro the product. Also, we have abalone farming, and the same thing happened with abalone, also mollusk. These are toxins in 2017, caused a big loss, and I'll show that in the next slide. So aquaculture farming is growing. The center of aquaculture farming with respect to abalone is in Walker Bay, illustrated in an insert, and then for perspectives, a larger map is shown at the bottom. So there's in four images on the side, I show you an event during 2017, where a harmful algal bloom, which is shown by the bright yellow color, um, with very high biomass, between 30 and 100 milligrams per cubic meter, is advected into Walker Bay. And these were used of toxic producing organisms, dinoflagellates, and the death of several million organisms with a financial loss of up to 50 million rand at the time. So what we needed to do is improve our identification of um, harmful algal blooms within the larger context of just looking at chlorophyll and concentration, and then also to be able to predict the advection of these blooms by understanding what's happening with sea surface temperature and the wind, the physical aspects. Next slide, please. So we have to take a closer look at the actual bands that we are sampling in to produce the different algorithms for identifying um, chlorophyll concentration. This uh, graph is illustrating some normalized water leading radiance spectra for different values of chlorophyll concentration. At the bottom, I've got uh, six bars. The first three bars represent the channels used for the uh, blue-green uh, algorithm to produce chlorophyll concentration for the global product. The other three bars, no. The other three bars, red bars, represent the channels used for the fluorescence line-out product. Now, chlorophyll can be derived both from the band ratio product in the blue-green zone and also from the fluorescence line-out product but slightly differently and with different reliability within the water column. So next slide, please. So as the uh, um, chlorophyll values increase, there's a shift to the left, of, uh, sorry, to the right, towards the red in the, in the, in the, towards the, in the normalized water leaving spectra. So the peak shifts to the right. There's an increase in the fluorescence line height peak which is illustrated in the far right, the blue arrow point, pointing up. The blue arrow pointing down is that there's a decrease in water leaving radiance in the blue-green part of the spectrum. So being able to use that algorithm to derive chlorophyll, which is the global algorithm, then becomes compromised. Next slide, please. So when you look at the negative values at 443, which is what we're looking at in the um, uh, blue-green algorithm, we'll see that the fluorescence uh, uh, line light product are still showing values of 0.10 to 0.17. Those curves that I'm looking at, the peak is quite strong, so it is unaffected, but whatever is affecting the uh, blue green part of the spectrum. And part of that is that, and the shift is that um, uh, as a chlorophyll uh, bloom proliferates, there's some senescence as the bloom dies off. Particles are released into the water, and there's an elevation of dissolved organic matter in the water. Now, this CDOM also affects the shift in this uh, peak that we are observing. And as the CDOM proliferates, it doesn't mean that there's less actual phytoplankton in the water, but it affects the way the algorithm chooses the aerosol uh, um, model to correct for these elevated radiances that are experienced. So then, the negative radiance is result from that, in, from that incorrect selection. So somehow we have to overcome that. The f all the flag areas represented by pink is where the incorrect aerosol algorithm was selected, and yet there are valid values that we should be able to retrieve if we can alter the algorithm. Next slide, please. So this is an example of the first time when a 
combination of algorithms we used, in this case for Meris, in 20, 2007, I believe, yes, March 2007, only left to have a modus image with the flag values. These two images are for the same day. The image on the right is showing retrievals within the flag area for Meris. This was done by using a combination of the red near infrared bands and also the um, blue green bands. Right? So what happened was at the low values, we use the reliable blue green algorithm, and as we go beyond 25 milligram per cubic meters, we shift to using the red bands, which is still retrieving our, uh, our chlorophyll values reliably. This is then further explored. Continue, please. Next slide. By looking at uh, um, validating this data against in situ sampling. So those two graphs on the right are showing validation data from uh, in situ sampling over a period of a decade or so. And various values have been uh, 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 matches have been illustrated over there. And what you can see is that there's a strong correlation for uh, satellite reflectances in um, Meris, in this case now, sorry, Alchi, we're using the same method as used in the Meris product. So what we are doing is just switching between what is working at the low, low chlorophyll values to something that's working in the high chlorophyll values. Now there's a gap between Meris and Alchi when you are trying to establish a continuity the climate data record that Jose was talking about, something for 20 years or more, there's a four year gap between those two instruments. So we have to use MODIS to fill that in. But MODIS doesn't have the two bands, or at least the one band that's available for producing that second product. So we have to look elsewhere. Thank you. So what we do is we look at the fluorescence line height product. And other people have shown, Wo et al, 2005, that there is a, a, a power uh, relationship between fluorescence line height and chlorophyll A concentration. But, of course, we have to go look at which values are we actually going to use to derive and check whether we can have the same relationship. And the important thing is we want clear skies, so we don't want cloud contamination. We want to make sure that we are outside those contaminated areas where we have elevated chlorophylls from uh, in erroneous aerosol selection models. And we want to be able to uh, uh, pick uh, values that are not compromised by sediment. So after selecting all these values, we do a regression and produce these two curves. The stars represent what we're seeing with World out on the top left, and the center. Yes. By season. Yes. So to see if the difference, but I was just considering AOD, aerosol optical depth. Yes. So I'm, I, I want to ask you, have you also considered how the chlorophyll concentration may change in the morning, from the morning to afternoon, but, but by season? Yes. So that's a very good question, because there's a diurnal dif uh, difference as well, which, which then affects that seasonal signal. Because you have low cumulus uh, clouds uh, that burn away during the course of the morning that affect terror much more than what it affects aqua. And then there's also the, um, the light availability at the different times of the day will affect the fluorescence line height that you are retrieving. So that's why I retrieved a separate uh, uh, um, regression for Terra and Aqua for, to, for, for the fluorescence line height derived chlorophyll A concentration. So, yes, please. Down, 
there, just, just there. So this is the ground truth thing that we did do. So what we did was over a period of about a decade, we have sampled periodically with incense and Dina Bay with a radiometer and then also taking in situ samples of chlorophyll A concentration and matching it to dinoflagellate populations of certain uh, concentrations. No, not blue-green algae, but specifically uh, um, red type producing algae, which is the dinoflagellus, that's the problem in our region. And we ground truth that, we validated that against, and this is what I'm trying to show you. So, so at the bottom of the graph, we've got the in -situ, log of the in situ chlorophyll A, and the satellite on the left of the graph, on the, on the y-axis. So the same kind of ground truthing was done for algae and mirrors so that we can produce a consistent result. So do you think if you add um, a more observation, do you think the correction may change? Or because I see it is, is it 70? Yes. So what happens is the, 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 the number of retrievals within the 35% uh, accuracy of the algorithms right, actually increases north of Elands Bay, the area that we were looking at in that illustration, we have the Olifants River mouthing and there would be some uh, sediment runoff into the area that we are considering. The concentrations aren't very high. And that is why the reason I mentioned, mentioned sediment is that the signal that we are perceiving and that we are actually masking using the standard modus algorithm looks like, like a sediment issue. But when you examine on a quasi true color image, you can clearly see that there's not a high sediment load in the water. So even though it's identified as such by the flag, something else must be happening. And this is where we considered what is happening with the color dissolved organic matter loading in the water and how that is affecting the algorithm. And then if we switch to looking at fluorescence linite, we can then distinguish that the actual signal has got chlorophyll in it and not sediment. So my colleague has worked on an algorithm for that. She's using um, the Alchi instrument, and she's been able to distinguish like dinoflagellates versus mixed populations versus uh, pseudo um, uh, Nitsia species. So she's been able to differentiate that, but honest, um, I have to look at, uh, and it's been published, so it has been validated, but like our uh, chairman has said, I think we need a bit more validation to really trust that algorithm. It's kind of preliminary still. It's been published and it, we've been using it, but we are using it as an um, inference rather as in truth. Yeah, because I think in fresh water we have the water high seams and, uh, mm -hmm. and other microphytes which may cause that. Um, yeah, we'd have to look at the spectra to kind of uh, in situ and the satellite and then take samples again. Like the kind of campaign like we had here. Thank you so much. Any other comments, suggestions? Or questions? I was interested also because the time is limited. Yeah. I was interested to hear about, you mentioned Copenhagen. Yeah, so I was wondering uh, the wind, the, the impact of wind in the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. especially the wind direction. Yes. Uh, because uh, I think you, 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 you show from January to April, I think. Yes. So what is the wind direction in the Indian Ocean? So we're looking at the Atlantic Ocean, sorry. So we're looking at the Atlantic and then also the um, just... Oh, okay, you're talking about beyond Cape Agalas. Yes, yes. All right. So the wind has got, to the, has got a different peak for the two zones. So on the west coast, the peak's a bit earlier and it's mostly southerly, southeasterly. And strength-wise and for upwelling, it peaks in late summer. Uh, and then on the south coast, the wind peaks in early autumn. And I looked at some data from um, uh, some satellite blended CCP satellite blended wind products. And uh, over the over the whole time period, 
to match with the upwelling and to be able to examine, because ultimately once we've got this kind of time series, we want to move away from just having the near real-time product. We want to be able to contextualize things within what's happened in the past, and then also understand what the setup is so that we can predict. So we can say, we okay, the physical conditions are such that we can expect a higher incidence of perhaps the algorithm developing. And for that, we use the wind data then also. advances in SAR image dispectoring uh, and change detection using deep learning approach. So you can start uh, presenting yourself. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Yassin Chunsi. I'm an associate researcher at Shaib Tukil University in Morocco. So my presentation talk about recent advances in synthetic aperture radar image dispecting and change detection using deep learning approaches. Next slide. So after, uh, after outlining my presentation, let me present our team, Mark Nova. So Mark Nova is the new consortium of GMS and Africa, uh, composed by different partners from west and north of Africa, including Morocco. So the objective of Mark Noah project is to provide different stakeholders and uh, decision makers uh, tools and uh, products related to uh, OSP detection, uh, fishing, potential fishing zone, and uh, the mapping of coastal zones. So here I show the, uh, our team in Morocco, composed by different uh, by professors, doctors, and PhD students. And here I show some uh, products, which we, we uh, for example, the, the figure in the right, the different OSP detected from 2017 to 2021, and the figure in left presents a uh, uh, fishing zone shown by the red colors. Also, we work about we work uh, on uh, OSP modeling by using the model to predict the possible uh, trajectory uh, made follow in or on a body of water such as OSP. So, I, my presentation uh, is composed by uh, five parts, including introduction and conclusion. So, I will present deep learning and then I will uh, explore um, a deep learning approaches for speaking noise and change detection. So the objective is to use exploit deep learning architectures to the noise and determine the change detection from uh, star image. Okay, so the synthetic aperture radar uh, becomes a very powerful air observation technologies uh, thanks to its possibility to de de detect ground surface in day and uh, night and in any uh, weather conditions. So, the figure in left shows that uh, the principle of SAR system. So the SAR system moves by scanning ground surface uh, in range and azimuth by emitting electromagnetic uh, waves at C bands, uh, L bands, or, or uh, X bands. It's depend to the system and its objective. And the figure in right shows an example of uh, the intensity of star image by showing the direction of azimuth and the range. An example of uh, star system is Sentinel-1, uh, launched, launched by European Space Agency. It is uh, two constellations, Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B, and uh, there is Sentinel-1C that be, will be launched in 2023. So this SAR system uh, work, works on four mode, modes. 
and chirpherometric white swatch mode, white mode, strip mode, and extra white swatch mode, and provide three levels of data. Level zero is the raw data, level one is the single low context and ground range detection image, and level two is related to the oceanographic data. So, as I say, when the, the star system, uh, uh, the, the electromagnetic wave are scattered by the ground surface, we have a self interference of these backscattered wave, electromagnetic waves. Okay? And this self interference generates so called speaking. So, speaking is a noise that affects this type of radar image, star image, and its presence affects the uh, quality of information extraction and then the necessity to reduce this, uh, this noise. So I'm going to present to talk a uh, little about uh, deep learning. So deep learning is a branch of machine learning and machine learning is also a branch of intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence uh, which make it to imitate the, the human behavior. So there are a lot of architecture based on deep learning and the famous is called convolutional neural network. So, so it is composed by different layers. So we have input image and the CNN is composed by convolution layer, uh, rectified linear unit and the poly layers and it's finished by a classif classification layers that say that the input image is, for example, a dog or not a dog. Uh, we use also so called the called resilient network. So this architecture will, will help us to uh, accelerate the, the speed of training of our uh, deep learning architecture. Next. We have used also the transfer learning. So this makes to transfer the, the knowledge uh, trained by an, uh, a deep learning architecture. This. And uh, I have realized that a bibliometric analysis related to the topics of used deep learning uh, for processing and analysis of SAR image. And I used the E3E Explorer Digital Library and I found that the published papers increase from 20, uh, 2014 to 2022. 20, 20, 20, 20. Also, the next, the majority of, of uh, published paper was also published at uh, H3E transaction on geoscience and remote sensing journey. Next. So now I, I present to you an application based uh, for speckled noise based on uh, uh, deep learning. So uh, firstly, I use some uh, data set to simulate the, 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 the noise step. Next. So the procedure is to take a clean image and add speckled noise for different variants. Okay? More this value of variance increase, more the uh, reduction of this noise is very complicated. And then I use uh, so called the called batch, batch normalized uh, convolutional neural network composed by three steps. The first step is related to pre -processing. The second step uh, is related to the uh, convolutional neural network and we finish by the denoising, the noise image. So here in left, we show the different uh, synthetic aperture radar simulation with different various variants of uh, speaker noise, and in right, the obtained result using our proposed deep learning approach. So for quantitative appraisal, uh, we use some image quality metrics as the PSNR, uh, Edge Preservation Index, and Image Quality Index. Next. And in term, next. In term, uh, no. Yeah, next. 
Next, next. No, next. Yeah. In terms of PS and R, we, 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 we see that our approach uh, gives the greatest value of PS and R between 27 and uh, 32 uh, decibel. Next. The same for image quality index. Next. And uh, for edge preservati pre preservation index, we see that our approach share uh, a good uh, a value between 92 and 94 uh, percent. Now I move to show you uh, the second application for chance detection. Uh, this, we have three steps. So the step one concerns the use of two Sentinel-1 SAR image of uh, Al Mansour Dahbi Dam area. It's a uh, dam located in, in Morocco to detect the flooded or non flooded region. Okay? So we, we do some pre processing step uh, as auto, uh, auto rectification, uh, speaker filtering, and uh, terrain correction. Next. And then we generate a, an histogram okay? uh, for determining a threshold value. Next. And this threshold value will be injected in um, this equation, the equation of water here, to generate two binarized image, one before flood and the second is after flood. And these two binarized image was the input of a step of clustering realized by a mask called RCNN. Okay? And next. And here, the, the, this mask RCNN uh, makes to, 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 to segment the different region in the binarized image before and after flood. Okay? And this segmentation is shown here by the red uh, gradient boxes. Next. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so here we have the, the, the output of uh, R and L mask. They are uh, an uh, RGB image. Next. And the final step concerns the data augmentation. Why? Because deep learning or uh, needs uh, great, uh, greatest uh, data set. Okay, so we have to 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 to, to produce the data set artificially by making some geometrical transformation, as uh, flipping the uh, uh, rotation and translation. Next, and at the moment we achieve the pre the precise accuracy of training of uh, ninety four percent. So, to conclude, uh, we have used a deep learning approach for speaker noising okay, and uh, change detection. We get uh, very accurate results and the common work is to uh, validate the proposed architecture for change detection by using some uh, data set as Ottawa data set, uh, Mexico data set. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yassin. Thank you. So this kind of deep learning is very, very interesting. And uh, maybe because of the time. So have you considered the accuracy? How the accuracy change in Northern and West Africa using uh, the approaches, different approaches you have used? Is the accuracy the same for both uh, Northern and West Africa? Just uh, I work on uh, Morocco. Morocco only. Morocco, yeah. So how about if you change? Because in Morocco, I think you are near Mediterranean. Mediterranean so, Ocean. Uh, so how about the area near the I think Sahara Desert? You don't touch the Sahara Desert. No. So I, because I want to know, ninety-four percent of accuracy is very high. Yeah. So <laughs> that's why I wanted to know if you have compared different region to see if the accuracy may change or... Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So have you considered different region in Morocco? Mm. Just work in uh, Adam. In the same place? Yes. Mm. Because normally uh, the approach also, I think, uh, may change due to the soil type. And To, um, I don't know if it is possible because your approach is very relevant and so our currency is so good and to join my colleague for what he said if it is possible to work together because I know the Mediterranean uh, literal for Morocco and Mauritanians can continue to Senegal and we try to I want to to have to, to, to do this work, this approach to the other side and to, to check if the accuracy will have the same or not because it is very important, his opinion, I think. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so, any comment? Maybe you can. Uh, so, sir, I think it is your time. <laughs> your presentation is. Yes. Okay. Hello everybody, my name is Adam Asal. I'm from Senegalese. Senegal, I work on Centre de Suivi Ecologique. It is a name in French. CES uh, is a lead of one GMS and Africa Consortium. We work on wetland and flooding. My presentation is, we have two. Is, one today and the next one on flooding tomorrow. This one is just a kind of overview on wetland and maybe some part of flooding. Next. Uh, I started my presentation for this image. Sometimes we talk about uh, satellite, we talk about ESA, we talk about NASA. And uh, when I started sometime, I ask, what do you think about it? It is something very hide, we don't know what NASA sometimes and uh, ESA. And it is just uh, talk about the uh, EO data. Next slide, please. Uh, we have many, many, many satellites around the world. I don't know. I'm working for to know really how much satellite we have at date to around the world. If someone knows the number, I appreciate to have it. <laughs> so, uh, yes, next. Please. Okay. Um, I think in GMS in Africa, or maybe um, many projects in EO data, the big challenge is to connecting EO data to uh, what the end user needs. It is sometimes not so easy to address and to make focus on the end user's need. Uh, and I think uh, it, I'm trying to explain our approach for to ask to to uh, to to, uh, to answer this question next please uh, GMS and Africa I think we we'll talk about uh, this um, tomorrow um, uh, this morning this is an initiative from your African European Union and African please next and uh, yes GMS and Africa is a big program we are in the second phase and our consortium is GDZIAO. In French is gestion durable des zones humides et de l'inondation en Afrique de l'Ouest. Next, please. Yes, it is uh, all these countries we uh, uh, we cover in our consortium, and we have uh, ten countries. Seven of them is a coastal area, and three in uh, in island. Uh, geographic cover for wetland services and. Uh, and, uh, and flooding services in wetland. We have uh, uh, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Gambia, Guinea, Mali, Niger, Senegal, and Ghana. We address two Ramsar sites. In, in the two Ramsar sites, we develop some application and some product for monitoring. And for flooding uh, sites, we have three basin. I think tomorrow we are going to develop for flooding services. Next. Uh, our main objective is to improve knowledge in West African wetlands from rational and sustainability management in order to contribute to food security, resilience, and socio-ecosystem. Uh, 
uh, basing on EO data and product. Uh, please, can you come back? Uh, we have one thematic, it is wetland and floating management. Two services we develop for the second phase, 10 countries. And in 10 countries, we mobilize um, uh, 15 uh, institutions. And uh, in the first phase, we have GD Zao. We have MIFMAF also, leading by CSTE from Nigeria. And we combine, we have GD Zao. Um, sometimes we say we we speak, uh, we speak China from Zhao. Okay, uh, this slide is to make a point from what sometimes our, our side, like expert, we want to do from end users. We develop in our side some product and is a kind of, yes, get it and, uh, and it, uh, you, you, you do what you want. I think it is very important, this slide, I like it. And uh, from this slide, next, we have building an, an approach is very, very, very uh, relevant. Uh, the approach is, firstly, we have a consultation and need assessment from uh, end users. After this, we have a stakeholder mapping, because it's very important to know in wetland services and flooding what is the key stakeholders okay and after this we develop the service design with the key stakeholders it is not to do the stakeholders mapping and after yes you stay and after you coming now we develop the service planning regime and the monitoring evaluation and learning is a process which is very transversal with each of step uh, and uh, we develop also a community of practice in the community of practice is very important for the service for wetland, we have some application and product. We have the first one is surface water exam for all site. I remember to explain we have two sites for uh, six countries, 12 sites, uh, Ramsar sites, okay? And for each site, we have a product for regularly, depending on Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 achievement, we have a product like a map or a graphic from surface water extent, water turbidity, we have soil moisture index for each site, extend mangrove for some site because the mangrove is, uh, exists for some site, not to all site, a potential area for aquatic invasive uh, plant. It is what we have now in our geo portal next. Um, another site is to contribute for policy and institutional uh, document and uh, we support wetland policies national at the national level. We have uh, implemented a national wetland policy. Um, in those countries, don't, we have not uh, this kind of document. And we develop and we update our wetland management plan. It is something very important for Ramsar. And the last one is a descriptive sheet for also those sheet with uh, in the Ramsar, in the Ramsar, in the Ramsar uh, uh, plan. Next, yes, it is our geo portal we have developing. It is uh, available and it is free. Uh, we have all document, all uh, uh, application and product I, I talk about uh, recently. Next, yes, uh, for the second phase, our objective is to operationalize all the services and wetland and then flooding. This is just for uh, what I want to share for this slide. It is to continue for wetland and flooding. We have six uh, relevant output, one of policy and an institutional framework, information services, EO data access, capacity building, knowledge management, and cross fertilization. And the last one is all related to communication outreach for each relevant uh, result. We have many activities, action, we are going to implement it in each country. And uh, I thank you. Mora uh, Kozi and Jeradiov is a wall of language for Senegal. Thank you a lot. Jeradiov. Yes, Jeradiov, as you said, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. So. I found the, the, the last slides about policies 
but uh, can you go up? There is uh, uh, down, down. Continue, continue. Yes, here. Yeah. So some countries are in black. Bold others. What is the difference? Um, when I when I make support the development of national wetland policy document, and you know Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, and the Gambia will not support it because we have the document. Okay, so Senegal, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Ghana, it is because the document is in this country, but we are going to update it because it's the kind of document we are going to update related to maybe four years, for, uh, for each year, something like that. And uh, the same, the implementation national wetland policy for Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and the Gambia. In these three countries, we don't have. So it is uh, elaborating the process starting because that make time. And when we say develop and update for target wetland management plan, it is concerning all countries we have in our consortiums. In one side, we develop because they are not. In one side, we update because they are, the countries have it maybe three or four years ago. Yes, we, have, we, we, we make the support to update it. So, so, yes, it is what I try to make some colors in black, some in not black. Thank you. And uh, another question. I saw that you, is it Ramsar? Ramsar sites? Ramsar sites, yes. Yeah, if you compare them with Sentinel. So, and you say it is coastal area, you found seven, seven uh, countries are in coastal, others they are inland. So if you compare the Ramsar site and Sentinel in coastal and uh, in inland, yes. where you, you have a higher I mean, agreement. Okay, it is a great question because, as you know, as you as you um, uh, you, you see, uh, we have different yes for the coastal and for the inland. Uh, the good accuracy we have for validation product because we are going to the field to take some uh, data, uh, ground data, and to validate it is. For the inland sites which have very accuracy because you don't have many a part of ocean or something like that. It is very difficult from the site which is in the coastal area to have a good accuracy. So, yes. Or any suggestion to improve that appearance? The suggestion is uh, because I go, we, we, we talk, uh, we discuss a more time to to the expertise group. I think we tried to, for the second phase, to go to collect more ground data for this site in the coastal area. Because we think we don't have more data, more ground data, and maybe, yes, that, that solve our problem for aquancy. Very interesting, with the flood monitoring. Any question or comment? Because uh, now the time is over. <laughs> so I think if there is no question, I can clap to him. Thank you, Dr. Sir. So we, can, we are going to go out for cocktail and networking. Because I am interested in some areas. So we can go out. Then we take her to work day. Thank you so much and we meet tomorrow again.